The internet, the internet, cell phones, and digital cameras that can transmit images over the internet makes possible a nation of storytellers, every citizen a Tom Paine. Let the man in the big house on Pennsylvania Avenue think that over. And the woman of the house on Capitol Hill. And the media moguls in their chalets at Sun Valley gathered to review the plantation's assets and multiply them, nail it to their door. They no longer own the copyright to America's story. It's not a top-down story anymore. Other folks are going to write this story from the ground up, and the truth will be out that the media plantation, like the cotton plantation of old, is not divinely sanctioned. It's not the product of, pro of natural forces. The media system we've been living under for a long time now was created behind closed doors where the power brokers met to divvy up the spoils. Bob McChesney has eloquently reminded us through the years how each medium, radio, television, and cable, was hailed as a technology that would give us greater diversity of voices, serious news, local programs, and lots of public service for the community. In each case, the advertisers took over. Despite what I teasingly told you the last time we were together in St. Louis, the star that shines so brightly in the firmament the year I was born, 1934, did not, I regret to say, appear over that little house in Hugo, Oklahoma. It appeared over Washington when Congress enacted the 1934 Communications Act. One hundred times in that cornerstone of our communications policy, you will read the phrase, public obligate interest, convenience, and necessity. I can't tell you, reading about it those days, educators, union officials, religious leaders, parents were galvanized by the promise of radio as a classroom for the air, serving the life of the country and the life of the mind, until the government cut a deal with the industry to make sure nothing would threaten the already vested interest of powerful radio networks and the advertising industry. And soon, the public largely forgot about radio's promise as we accepted the entertainment produced and controlled by Jell-O, Maxwell House, and Camel Cigarettes. What happened to radio happened to television, and then it happened to cable, and if we are not diligent, it will happen to the Internet. Powerful. Powerful forces are at work now determined to create our media future for the benefit of the plantation. Investors, advertisers, owners, and the parasites who depend on their indulgence, including many in the governing class. Old media acquire new media and vice versa. Rupert Murdoch, forever savvy about the next key outlet that will attract eyeballs, purchased MySpace, spending nearly $600 million so he could, in the language of Wall Street, monetize those eyeballs. Google became a partner in Time Warner, investing $1 billion in its AOL online service. And now Google has bought YouTube, so it would have a better vehicle for delivering interactive ads for Madison Avenue. Viacom, Microsoft, large ad agencies, and others have been buying up key media properties, many of them the leading online sites, with the result that will be a thoroughly commercialized environment, a media plantation for the 21st century dominated by the same corporate and ideological forces that have produced the system we have lived under the last 50 years. So, what do we do? Well, you've shown us what we have to do, and twice now you have shown us what we can do. Four years ago, when FCC Commissioner Michael Powell and his ideological sidekicks decided it was okay for a single corporation to own a community's major newspaper, three of its TV stations, eight radio stations, its cable TV system, and its major broadband internet provider, you said, enough's enough. Free press, Common Cause, Consumers Union, Media Access Project, the National Association of Hispanic Journalists, and others working closely with Commissioners Edelstein and Copps, two of the most public-spirited members of that commission ever to sit there. You, 
You organized public hearings across the country where people spoke up deeply felt opinions about how poorly the media was serving their towns. You flooded Congress with petitions, and you never let up. And when the court said Powell had to back off for then, the decision cited the importance of involving the public in these media decisions. Incidentally, Powell not only backed off, he backed out. He left the commission to become senior advisor at a private investment firm specializing in equity investments in media companies around the world. And that firm, by the way, made a bid to take over both Tribune and Clear Channel, two media companies that just a short time ago were under the corporate-friendly purview of, you guessed it, Michael Powell. That whishing sound you hear is Washington's perpetually revolving door through which they come to serve the public and through which they leave to join the plantation. You made a difference. You showed the public cares about media and democracy. You turned a little publicized vote, little publicized because big media didn't want the people to know, a little publicized and seemingly arcane regulation into a big political fight and a public debate. Now, it's true, as Commissioner Copps has reminded us, that since that battle three years ago, there have been more than 3,300 TV and radio stations that have had their assignment and transfer grants approved. So that even under the old rules, consolidation grows, localism suffers, and diversity dwindles. It's also true that even as we speak, Michael Powell's successor, Kevin Martin, put there by George W. Bush, is ready to take up where Powell left off and give the green light to more conglomeration. Get ready to fight. But then you did it again more recently. You lit a fire on the people to put Washington on notice that it had to guarantee the Internet's First Amendment protection in the $85 billion merger of AT&T and Bell South. Because of you, the so-called Internet neutrality, I much prefer to call it the equal access provision of the Internet. Neutrality makes me think of Switzerland. <laughs> the equal access provision became a public issue that once again reminded the powers that be that people want the media to foster democracy, not to quench it. This is crucial. This is crucial because in a few years, virtually all media will be delivered by high-speed broadband. And without equality of access, the net could become just like cable television, where the provider decides what you see and what you pay. After all, the Bush Department of Justice had blessed the deal last October without a single condition or statement of concern. But they hadn't reckoned with Michael Copps and Jonathan Adelstein, and they hadn't reckoned with this movement. Free Press and SaveTheInternet.com orchestrated 800 organizations, a million and a half petitions, countless local events, legions of homemade videos, smart collaboration with allies in industry, and a top-shelf communications campaign. Who would have imagined that sitting together in the same democratic broadband pew would be the Christian Coalition, Gun Owners of America, Common Cause, and MoveOn.org? Who, who would have imagined that these would link arms with some of the powerful new media companies to fight for the Internet's First Amendment? We owe a tip of the hat, of course, to Republican Commissioner Robert McDowell. Despite what must have been a great deal of pressure from his side, he did the honorable thing and recused himself from the proceedings because of a conflict of interest. He might well have heard the roar of the public that you helped to create. So AT&T had to cry uncle to Copps and Edelstein with a, quote, voluntary commitment to honor equal access for at least two years. The agreement marks the first time that the federal government has imposed true neutrality, oops, equality, on an Internet access provider since the debate erupted almost two years ago. I believe you changed the terms of the debate. It is no longer about whether equality of access will govern the future of the Internet. It's about when and how. It also signals a, defense from defense, from a, a change from defense to offense for the backers of an open net. Arguably, the biggest, most effective online organizing campaign 
ever conducted on a media issue can now turn to passing good laws rather than always having to fight to block bad ones. Just this week, just this week, Senator Byron Dorgan, a Democrat, and Senator Olympia Snow, a Republican, introduced the Internet Freedom Preservation Act of 2007 to require fair and equitable access to all content. And over in the House, that champion of the public interest, Ed Markey, is once again standing there waiting to press the battle. But a, but a caveat here, those other folks don't give up so easy. Remember, this agreement is only for two years, and they'll be back with all the lobbyists money can hire. As the Washington Post follows George Bush into the black hole of Baghdad, the press in Washington won't be covering many stories like this because of priorities. Furthermore, caveat, consider what AT&T got in the bargain. For giving up on neutrality, it got the green light from government to dominate over 67 million phone lines in 22 states, almost 12 million broadband users, and total control over Singular Wireless, the country's largest mobile phone company with 58 million cell phone users. It's as if China swallowed India. I bring this up for a reason. Big media is ravenous. It never gets enough, always wants more, and it will stop at nothing to get it. These conglomerates are an empire, and they are imperial. Last week on his website, MediaChannel.org, Danny Schechter call, recalled how some years ago he marched with a band of media activists to the headquarters of all the big media companies concentrated in the Times Square area. Their formidable buildings, fronted with logos and limos and guarded by rent cops projected their power and prestige. Danny and his cohorts chanted and held up signs calling for honest news and an end to exploitative programming. They called for diversity and access for more perspectives. It felt good, Danny said, but it seemed like a fool's errand. We were ignored, patronized, and marginalized. We couldn't shake their edifices or influence their holy business models. We seemed to many like that lonely and forlorn nut in a New Yorker cartoon carrying an end of the world is near placard. Well, yes, my friends, that is exactly how they want you to feel. As if media and democracy is a fool's errand. To his credit, Danny didn't give up. He's never given up. Neither have some of the earlier pioneers in this movement, Andy Schwartzman, Don Hazen, Jeff Chester. I confess that I came very close not to making this speech today in favor of just getting up here and reading from this book, Digital Destiny, by my friend and co-conspirator, Jeff Chester. Take my word for it. Make this your Bible, until McChesney's new book comes out. <laughs> As Don Hazen writes in his review on Alternet this week, it's a terrific book, a respectful, loving, fresh, intimate conversation, comprehensive history of the struggles for a democratic media, the lost fights, the opportunities missed, and the small victories that have kept the corporate media system from having complete carte blanche over the communications channels. It's also a terrifying book because Jeff describes how we are being shattered online by a slew of software digital gumshoes working for Madison Avenue. Our movements in cyberspace are closely tracked and analyzed, and interactive advertising infiltra infiltrates our unconsciousness to promote the brand washing of America. Jeff asked the hard questions, how do we really want television, do we really want television sets that monitor what we watch? Or an internet that knows what sites we visit and reports back to advertising companies? Do we really want a media system designed mainly for Madison Avenue? But this is a hopeful book. After scaring the bejeepers out of us, as one reviewer wrote, Jeff offers a policy agenda for the broad broadband era. Here's a man who practices what the Italian philosopher Gramsci called the pessimism of the intellect and the optimism of the will. He sees the world as it is without rose-colored glasses and tries to change it despite what he knows. So you'll find here, 
You'll find here the core of the movement's mission. You'll agree with much and disagree with some, but that's what a reform movement is about. Media reform, yes. But the Project in Excellence concluded in its State of the Media report for 2006, quote, at many old media companies, though not at all, the decades-long battle at the top between idealists and accountants is now over. The idealists have lost. The commercial networks are lost, too, lost to silliness, farce, cowardice, and ideology. Not much hope there. You can't raise the dead. Policy reform, yes. But, says Jeff, we will likely see more consolidation of ownership with newspaper, TV stations, and major online properties in fewer hands. So, he says, we have to find other ways to ensure the public has access to diverse, independent, and credible sources of information. That means going to the market to find support for stronger independent media. Michael Moore and others have proven that progressivism doesn't have to equal penury. It means helping protect news gathering from predatory forces. It means fighting for more participatory media hospitable to a full range of expression. It means building on Lawrence Lessig's notion of the creative common and Brewster Kahle's Internet archives with his philosophy of universal access to all knowledge. It means bringing broadband service to those many millions of Americans too poor to participate so far in the digital revolution. It means... It means ownership and participation for people of color and women. And let me tell you, it means reclaiming public broadcasting and restoring it to its original, to its original feisty, robust, fearless mission as an alternative to the dominant media, offering journalism you can't afford and can trust, public affairs of which you're a part, and a wide range of civic and cultural discourse that leaves no one out. You can have an impact here. For one thing, we need to remind people that the federal commitment to public broadcasting in this country is about $1.50 per capita compared to $28, million, $28 to $85 per capita in other democracies. But there's something else I want you to think about, something else you can do, and I'm going to let you in here on one of my fantasies. Keep it to yourself, if you will because fantasies are private matters, and mine involves Amy Goodman. But I'll, I, I'll just ask C-SPAN to, to bleep this out and, oh, shucks, what's the use? Here it is. Here it is. In moments of reverie, I imagine all of you returning home to organize a campaign to persuade your local public television station to start airing democracy now. All right. I, I can't think of a single act more likely to remind people of what public broadcasting should be or that this media reform conference really means business. We've got to get alternative content out there to people or this country is going to die of too many lies. And the opening rundown of news on Amy's Daily Show is not like nothing else on any television, corporate, or public. It's as if you open the window in the morning and a fresh breeze rolls over you from the ocean. Amy doesn't practice trickle-down journalism. She goes where the silence is, and she breaks the sound barrier. She doesn't buy the Washington Protocol that says the truth lies somewhere in the spectrum of opinion between the Democrats and the Republicans. On democracy now, the truth lies where the facts are hidden, and Amy digs for them. And above all, she believes the media, the media should be a sanctuary for dissent, the underground railroad tunneling beneath the plantation. So go home weary for dissent, the underground railroad tunneling beneath the plantation. So go home and think about it. After all, you are the public in public broadcasting and not just during pledge breaks. You live there and you can get the boss man at the big house to pay attention.
Meanwhile, be vigilant about the congressional rewrite of the Telecommunications Act that is beginning as we speak. Track it day by day and post what you learn far and wide because the decisions made in this session of Congress will affect the future of all media, corporate and non-commercial, and if we lose the future now, we'll never get it back. So you have your work cut out for you. I'm glad you're all younger than me and up to it. I'm glad so many funders are here, because while an army may move on its stomach this movement requires hard, cold cash to compete with big media in getting the attention of Congress and the people. I'll try to do my part. Last time we were together, I said to you that I should put my detractors on notice. They might just compel me out of the rocking chair and back into the anchor chair. Well, Well, in, in, in April, I will be back with a new weekly series called Bill Morgan's Journal. And I, thanks to some of the funders in this room. I hope to compliment. We'll, t we'll, take, we'll take the money from public broadcasting because it compromises you even when you don't intend it to, or they don't intend it to. I hope to compliment the fine work of colleagues like David Boncaccio of Now and David Fanning of Frontline, who also go for the truth behind the news. But I don't want to tease you. I'm not coming back because of my detractors. I wouldn't torture them that way. I'll leave that to Dick Cheney. I'm, I'm coming back because it's what I do best because I believe television can still signify, signify, and I don't want you to feel so alone. I'll keep an eye on your work. You are to America what the abolition movement was, and the suffragette movement, and the civil rights movement. You touch the soul of democracy. It's not assured you'll succeed in this fight. The armies of the Lord are up against mighty hosts. But as the spiritual sojourner Thomas Merton wrote to an activist grown weary and discouraged protesting the Vietnam War, do not depend on the hope of results. Concentrate on the value and the truth of the work itself. And in case you do get lonely, I'll leave you with this. As my plane was circling Memphis the other day, I looked out across those vast miles of fertile soil that once were plantations watered by the Mississippi River and the sweat from the brow of countless men and women who'd been forced to live somebody else's story. I thought about how in time, with a lot of martyrs, they rose up one here, then two, then many, forging a great movement that awakened America's conscience and brought us closer to the elusive but beautiful promise of the Declaration of Independence. As we made our last approach, the words of a Marge Piercy poem begin to form in my head, and I remembered all over again why I was coming and why you were here. What can they do to you? Whatever they want. They can set you up. They can bust you. They can break your fingers. They can burn your brain with electricity blur you with drugs till you can't walk, can't remember. They can take your child, wall up your lover. They can do anything you can't blame them from doing. How can you stop them? Alone, you can fight and you can refuse. You can take what revenge you can. 
but they roll over you. But two people fighting back to back can cut through a mob. A snake dancing file can break a cordon. An army can meet an army. Two people can keep each other sane, can give support, conviction, love, massage, hope, sex. Three people are a delegation, a committee, a wedge. With four, you can play bridge and start an organization. <laughs> with six, you can rent a whole house, eat pie for dinner with no seconds, and hold a fundraising party. A dozen make a demonstration. A hundred fill a hall. A thousand have solidarity and your own newsletter. <laughs> Ten thousand power and your own paper. A hundred thousand your own media. Ten million your own country. It goes on one at a time. It starts when you care to act. It starts when you do it again after they said no. It starts when you say we and know who you mean, and each day you mean one more. Bill Moyers. Bill spoke of his fantasies. I have a fantasy that someday my write-in vote will combine with those tens of millions of others, and we will finally elect a president worthy of this nation, and he will be named Bill Moyers. This is Bill's third time addressing a national conference on media reform. The first conference, we had 1,800 people. The second conference, 2,200. Today, in this room, more than 3,000 people. There are people sitting along the walls. They're in the hallways. This is a movement bursting at its seams. You know the schedule, and we will be back in this room, write it down, don't, don't mess up, we will be back in this room at 12.15 precisely. Follow your schedule, go to the events you want to. Know also that there are dozens of other events associated with this conference, some inside the hall, some near it. I want to alert you to two of them. Independent World Television, which is seeking to build an international television network competing with big media. Tomorrow night, Saturday, 6 p.m., room 1821. Great session, a chance to see a lot of new media. Also, our oldest allies, perhaps the United Church of Christ, with us from the very beginning, before we were a movement in many ways. The group that will bring 10,000 people next June to see Bill Moyers address their 50th annual General Synod. We'll be holding an event at First Congregational Church tonight at 5.30 p.m., featuring journalist Randall Pinkston, just back from Baghdad. A worthy event. Finally, I do want to note here, there's a woman in the crowd, I, I believe, Phyllis Daly from Montreal. Please, if you can, when we finish now, make your way up to stage right. Josh Silver has a message for you. And I want to close with this. Before I came up here again, a woman came up to me, Loris Ann Taylor, the executive director of the Native Public Media Movement, she said, I wonder if you could give a shout out to Native American journalists who are here. We are in the movement all the way.
And I said to her, if the first Americans are in this movement, then truly we have come first circle. First Americans and new Americans united with one demand, that this nation have a just, diverse, and democratic media, a media that is worthy of a great nation. Go out and build it. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Bill Moyers. Thank you, Danny Glover. And thank you to all of you.